organizers for the invitation today. I feel very privileged to be speaking at this important Congress. And I'm talking about something that I think is really important but often overlooked. Um, Professor Pavarajnev discussed um, how de important DEXA is in FRAX and a little bit on TBS. And it is a very useful tool. It's a good tool, but unfortunately, it's not done well very often. And when you have your base test that's not being done very well, we have issues when we start to look at FRAX and TBS and diagnostic criteria. So I'm going to take just a few minutes to discuss some of the issues with DEXA testing worldwide, briefly talk about the appropriate way to acquire and analyze scans, and show you some examples of things that should be avoided in DEXA. This is actually an old study, and it was done through the International Society for Clinical Densitometry. And what they did is they pulled their members, and they requested uh, whether to the, they requested they complete a survey which talked about how often they saw inappropriate DEXs in their practice. And unfortunately, we see that a large number, um, almost 50%, uh, saw errors greater than once a week or once a week. And when we look at the group that says once a month, our clinicians are seeing errors, almost 70% uh, of our clinicians are seeing errors in their practice. And this can lead to inappropriate diagnosis and inappropriate use of medications. So it is a problem. Um, as I mentioned, this is an older study. I'm going to go through just a few studies that are more recent. There's about uh, 15 published studies that actually look at data from specific facilities talking about uh, their quality. Uh, these first two come from Turkey. The first one looked just at uh, positioning of DEXA, and they looked at 113 patients. And when they were reviewing hip and spine scans, what they found is that over half errors in uh, the spine errors had positioning problems, and about 83% of hip scans had positioning problems. And just to give you some reference, the radiology literature accepts somewhere between 2 and 5% error in radiologic testing. So you can see that these are dramatically higher than what is acceptable. The other thing interesting about this study is that less than 10% of all of the studies were, uh, had both hip and spine that didn't have any errors. The second study is from 20 hospitals across 15 cities, and this study looked at over 3,000 patient exams. And again, we're seeing very high uh, error rates and compared to that 5% that's acceptable. Um, we're seeing 32% at the spine, 49 at the hip. This is a little different because they also looked at positioning and analysis, so we're starting to see a few more errors. Um, the other thing I thought was notable, again, are the ranges. So on the high end of our ranges, we're seeing error rates of uh, over almost two-thirds of our patient population. Um, another thing that I thought was interesting about this study is that very common errors are region of interest placement, and that's at both the spine and the hip. And these are errors that could be corrected before the reports come out. So your patient doesn't need to be in the office to have these corrected. And because of that, we should be able to correct some of those things uh, before we get to interpretation. Um, and unfortunately, we're not great at doing that either. Um, here's a study that's been cited frequently that came out of Italy a number of years ago. And this is evaluating femur positioning, uh, uh, positioning at the femur and the spine. And again, what they found is that there were a lot of errors in analysis. Uh, most of them only had one error, but again, almost 20% had at least two errors. So again, really high rates overall when they're looking at a per patient sample. They reported that 93% of the patients that they tested had some sort of error. These are some data that come from the states, actually out of our institution. And this is a serial number of individuals that were referred to our specialty clinic. So these came from uh, outside the community and some within our hospital, but went to our specialists. And again, we're seeing extremely high rates of errors, uh, up above 50 and 70 percent. Again, mostly at the spine and the hip. And a thing that's a little different here is spine. Most of our errors are analysis, but at the hip, a lot of them are positioning. 
Um, so unfortunately, these would probably require patients to come back, but again, when we're looking at the spine and the forearm, there are a lot of analysis errors that could be corrected. Um, I will come back to this study toward the end of my discussion to talk a little bit about interpretation. So I'm briefly going to go through some appropriate techniques and what you should be seeing. If you have the opportunity to see your scans to validate that they've been interpreted correctly, these are some things that you should look at. So your images should have your patient centered in the scan field. And the reason for that is that the soft tissue on either side of the bone is also very important in the DEXA calculations. So it's important that that be imaged. You should start in the middle of L5, they should go up to T12, and we should be seeing ribs, and we should be seeing hips. That anatomy will help us identify our regions, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. These are some things that you should not see, and this, these contribute to a number of the errors that were reported in these prior studies. So as we all know, having metal in our scans is not good. If it's over the bone, we're seeing an artificial elevation of the bone density that's being measured. And if it's in the soft tissue, we can actually be seeing a decrease depending on how the computer reads them. So it's very important that external things be removed from our scans. And here's an example of bra hooks and a zipper. Again, we have uh, material from bras. This is actually a navel piercing, which at least in the States is becoming more popular. Um, and in this instance, is falsely elevating the bone density at L3. Uh, there are some things that we cannot remove. Uh, in this example, again, we could remove these underwires, but we're not going to be able to move this surgical hardware. And the best we can do is just to elect not to report that. So uh, from a technology standpoint, we can go ahead and acquire the scan. From a reporting standpoint, our interpreter is only going to report the values between L1, 2, and 3 because this metal, again, is negatively impacting the measurement at L4. Scoliosis, this was discussed earlier today. Uh, this is a condition that we can't really do a lot about from a DEXA standpoint. Uh, there are issues with scoliosis in that we do see a lot of sclerosis on most of the vertebral bodies, and we know that that in and of itself is artificially elevating the measurements. Um, but if we have a patient that has a spine that looks like this and still has low bone density, it's really quite striking information. Um, but from a positioning standpoint, this is not someone that we're going to be able to straighten and center the way that we like. So we're just going to have to accept that there's going to be some confounding in the scan. Um, here's an example of some artifacts that we need to make our patients come back. So IV contrast and barium indexa scans are a problem in that they emit uh, radiation and our detectors don't pick up the uh, radiation that's being emitted through the patient appropriately. And this can either increase or decrease the BMD depending on where they are, if it's over the bone or in the soft tissue. So unfortunately, in this case, our patients need to go home. This is why it's important to scan them prior to getting testing, like uh, PET scans and other nuclear medicine testing. And we usually allow about 10 days for this to clear in most people. Um, so spine analysis, what we're going to want to see again are the ribs, this tells us where T12 is, the iliac crest helps us identify L5. The intervertebral markers, so these markers right here, should fall right into the disc space between each of the vertebral bodies. The edges, which are the red lines in this case, should outline the bone. So everything inside our red lines will be counted and will be measured as bone. Um, it's important to label the spine correctly, and again, we can use our anatomy to help us do that. Um, if we have them labeled inappropriately, we can sometimes get the T-score calculated wrong. Uh, again, our bone density as we go down the spine will uh, be higher, so if we're comparing L3 to an L4 database, we're going to have issues with our T-score derivation. So it is important to get this correct, and it's most important to be consistent when we're seeing follow-up scans. This is just a little schematic that we put out for people to help identify what the vertebral body should look like. 
Radiologists really dislike this because they don't believe that this is what they look like, but to the untrained eye, I think this can be helpful. At least it is for me. So L5 kind of looks like a bow tie or a sideways eye. Four sort of has this X in it, and three, two, and one generally have this Y shape to it. And these characteristics can also aid in correctly labeling our vertebral bodies. <coughs> Um, it's important to get our markers, our vertebral markers, in the right spot. Um, here's an example where the disc space between L4 and 5 isn't very clear. This can be real common as our patients can't always flatten their back well enough to separate the vertebral bodies for us. And you can see that depending on where you put this line, you're going to generate different bone density values and different T-scores. So again, it's important to be correct to the best of our ability, but it's most important to be consistent over time. Um, again, here's an example if you're reviewing to, do, to report. Here's an example where we don't exactly have that vertebral marker in the right spot again. And we're seeing osteoarthritis. And in most of our patients, we're going to see that. Um, it is recommended that you try and remove these edges. Uh, again, bone density is an aerial measurement. So if we widen the area that we are measuring and uh, include that BMC, we're going to get erroneous measurements. So we try to uh, remove the contribution of the osteophytes. When to do this can be really challenging, and our manufacturers don't do a lot to help us determine that. Um, the manual for the GE densitometer says to accept the program's placement of edges unless they're obviously incorrect. This is a very subjective recommendation. Um, so just to kind of give us a guide, we fall back to an old recommendation of an area that's greater than a 5x5 five five pixel. So this is a 5x5 five five pixel. This is carryover from the uh, pencil beam days, if you remember that. And here's an example of where we don't have enough air. So you can see the vertebral body comes out here, and the computer has identified what it's calling bone in green. And there's a small area here that hasn't been included, but it's probably not going to have a huge impact. Here, we have a larger area of bone. And this is somewhere where I would go in and move these edges out so that when the computer calculates the value, they're going to include that part of the bone. Here's another example where one would exclude osteophytes. So again, the red edges outline what bone should be included or is going to be included. And clearly, we're having uh, osteoarthritis on this side of the vertebral body. And these orange lines here are just a recommendation of where you might want to move those edges in. Um, proximal femur, again, this is really important because we know it calculates well with, or it correlates well with hip fracture. Just like our spine, we want it to be aligned and in the center of our scan field. We do want it to be rotated about 30 degrees, and that does two things. One, it opens up the area here so that we don't have the greater trochanter uh, coming in. And two, it helps give us space uh, between the ischium and the neck box. Again, it allows us to put a clean area of where the femoral neck goes. Uh, looking at the lesser trochanter, if you can just see a sliver of it, that's a good indication that we have the recommended amount of rotation. It's about 30%. You want to start about 6 centimeters below the pelvis and include about another 3. On the hips, the area of soft tissue that is sampled is right here and right here. So we want to make sure that our scan includes enough of the anatomy that we can appropriately calculate the bone density for this area. I'm going to go over two different ways to measure the neck box on uh, the GE manufacturers and also Hologic because they do it a little bit differently. GE will look for the narrowest part of the neck and the lowest bone density and center the box on that area. So the neck box for GE instruments tends to be up a little bit closer to the head. For the Hologic, they will anchor the neck box at the end of the greater trochanter. So they tend to be back a little bit further toward the trochanter. What this means is the two instruments really are not measuring the same area of the neck. 
This is a reason why you can't necessarily compare from one manufacturer to the other because they're not even measuring the same region and they also don't generate the same amount of bone density. So the GE manufacturers will measure about 10% higher than Hologic. The T-scores will always be the same, but the BMD is a little bit different. This is an example of external artifacts in the hip. Uh, generally, you don't have quite as many, but if you look very closely, you can see a button in the middle of the neck on this particular uh, patient. And when this patient was rescanned, we changed their bone density by about 20%. So it is important that we identify these uh, external artifacts and have them removed. Um, this is another case of internal hardware. Unlike the spine, when we see this in the hip, we just have to exclude it. We can't uh, correct the area around it and get a meaningful measurement. Um, and unfortunately, we have seen these come through the clinic. And we've seen people that have had increases of up to 50% in their bone density when they've had new surgical hardware implanted since the last scan. Uh, obviously, this is contributing to erroneous uh, reporting. Um, looking at the hip scans, there's a couple things that I like to have people watch for. So here in the neck box, this is a very small example, but you can see that the red lines that should outline the bone are outlining a little bit of the soft tissue. So in this case, because we're making the area bigger and we're adding a region with no bone mineral content, we are artificially lowering the bone mass in the neck of this individual. Here. On the other side, you can see again, our edges are running wider. It should come up right along the inside of the femoral neck. We're including some ischium here. So we're increasing the area. We're also increasing BMC. So it's unclear whether or not we will raise or lower the bone density at the neck, but the likelihood is high that it isn't going to be correct, whatever our value is, until we go in and move this. So this is an example of what I was showing earlier, where a lot of the errors in DEXA are these analysis errors. And these are things that can go back to our technologists and be corrected before they get reported by our physicians. Quickly, I want to look at the forearm. Again, like the other two scans, it should be straight in the center of the field. Um, it's usually pretty easy to get your soft tissue in because it's such a small area. And our patients are going to be seated, or the newer scanners will allow you to do it supine. And if you're using hologic instruments, you have to remember to measure the length of your forearm so it can appropriately place the one-third ROI for us. Um, in general, unless somebody has jewelry or uh, sleeves over their forearm, these are pretty clean scans, but here are some examples of motion. Uh, even though you could get a clean ultradistal and a one-third, this is not an acceptable scan. This should be repeated. And it's a very quick scan. It takes about 10 or 15 seconds. There's really no reason not to repeat this scan. Uh, and on the other side, we see movement. This is a person with a tremor. And this isn't anything that we can correct. Um, when we do our analysis, at least for GE, we should put the uh, bar at the end of the ulna, and that will automatically set our radius. Uh, for Hologic, you do want to type this, and it will set your regions based on the length that you put in. Again, our bone edges should outline the bone and only include bone that we want to measure. This is an error that those of you that have access to GE instruments, I just want to make clear to people because it's not something that I think is talked about a lot. Um, they require that you use this little plastic board uh, to help mimic soft tissue when you do the forearm. And the problem with that are these little air holes. And when you do a scan, and these air holes are either at the very beginning or the very end of your scan, it generates a problem with the algorithms. Um, the computer is expecting to see plastic there, and it puts out algorithms to measure the plastic. And when it gets air, it gets all confused. And what it does is it includes the board in its soft tissue sampling. So you can see here where the arm is. That's what should be highlighted in green here as soft tissue. But because of this air hole, it's also including the board. 
and what that's doing is it's falsely elevating our measurements, our values at the forearm. So it is really important that these be done correctly and that the technologists look at the tissue typing before it's released for uh, measurement. This is another example of problems with forearm. You can see here this person has buttons, so they have a sleeve that's been bent over. And the buttons are being picked up as soft tissue, and you can see along the outside where the end of the sleeve is. So we do recommend that all of the clothing be removed from the forearm before it gets measured. Again, depending on what the error is, uh, it will either increase or decrease the bone density um, when it's picking up clothing and other things that aren't either bone or soft tissue. So, um, in summary, to when you're evaluating your bone density measurements to see whether or not they're appropriate for interpretation, you want to check positioning. Is it straight? Is it centered? Are the, is the bone inside the edges that are determined? Are there any artifacts? If they're external, can we have them removed? If they're internal, they just need to be noted and commented on in your report. And are the regions of interest in the appropriate areas? And just a quick review at the spine, the L1 through 4 vertebrae should be in the disc spaces and our edges should be around the bone. We should see ribs, we should see hips. And our femurs, we want to make sure that that neck box is in the right place um, per our manufacturer recommendations and free of artifacts. And same with our forearm, we want our ultradistal area just below the end plate and the one third set based on the uh, appropriate region for our manufacturer. Finally, I want to go back to our earlier slides that talked a little bit about some of the errors. So the early slides talked about the technical aspects. And one of the studies actually also looked at some of the reporting issues. And there are two sites evaluated here. Um, about 300 people, this is from the last study that I, looked, that I uh, presented. And initially, site A actually did kind of okay. They had a 20% error rate compared to some of the other numbers we were seeing. And the other site in the study had a 73% error rate. And ISCD has a template that they put out for reporting, and they recommend that people use it. So what happened is we went back to these two sites and recommended that they start using a template just for the reporting to see if we could improve errors. And in this case, an error was defined as something that's wrong in the report that would lead a physician potentially to make an incorrect decision with their patient either treat someone that didn't need treating or not treat someone that should have been treated. And we wanted to test to see whether or not use of this template would help. And what they found is that it did help quite a bit. Um, and it reduced them by over 50% in one case. So at site A, that was pretty good to begin with, went down to 7% error rate. And site B, 26%. So a simple thing like just implementing a template and making sure that your interpreters are systematically looking at things can really improve the quality of DEXA. And if you have the opportunity, it's good to look at your scans so you can see whether or not some of the errors that we talked about earlier are present or if it was done appropriately. And thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Chris, for your talk. Can you hear me? Yes. May I ask you whether you think there are some, uh, there is a need of some supervision nationally, or I would, I would suggest some national supervision of the consistency of reported and analyzed scans, because we have problems. The results are really inconsistent, at least in my country. So, so there is, of course, we are in the US and we are in Europe, and ISCD is not always able to influence the quality of the scans. I'm very confused with some reports and analysis and some contents and the four associated results and 
just implications? Yeah. So I think your question is, is there a need for some international oversight to give guidance and help improve this uh, quality issue? And you mentioned it's an issue in your country. It's truly an issue worldwide. Um, and ISCD is aware of that. Um, there are courses that they have put together that help with the interpretation and the technical aspect, and you're correct that they are challenging to access in some cases, and we really need a regional champion to bring it to some of the local areas. So I do think that there's a great need. Um, the positions do offer some standardization to how to do it. Unfortunately, they do defer back to the manufacturers for some of the real specifics. Um, we do have a white paper published that talks about uh, the best practices for DEXA. This is a Lewicki reference that is available uh, online to everyone uh, at the ISCD website. This is published in their journal, but this particular paper is free for everyone. So there are some things out there that offer some reference, but you are correct that we have a huge quality problem. It is a global problem, and there is a dramatic need for us to be better at accessing people and giving them the information that they need. And that's something that we're working on, and unfortunately I can't say that's going to happen tomorrow. Thank you very much for the presentation. Uh, today, more oh, we have uh, clinical situation, patients with uh, uh, post-transplantation osteoporosis after vertebroplasty. Vertebroplastic lumbar one to lumbar four, lumbar five. What is the, um, what assessment uh, um, lumbar spine and bone mineral density in these <coughs> patients? And uh, what uh, diagnosis in these patients? So the question I believe is what to do with bone densitometry in patients that have had vertebral augmentation for vertebral fractures. This is becoming much more common. Unfortunately, if they've had augmentation to the lumbar vertebral bodies, right now DEXA is not a tool that we can use to assess the spine. Um, however, we can look at their hips and we can look at their forearms. So we do recommend that those be measured in instances where we can't use the spine due to either vertebroplasty or severe degenerative disease. And we can apply the NOF, diag or I'm sorry, the WHO diagnostic criteria at the hip and the forearm, and we always like to have two, me two sites to validate our measurements. So those are our options right now, and uh, as you mentioned earlier, we can use the hip values for FRAX, and that's going to be really important in these patients also. Thank you. Thank you. Questions? No questions. Thank you. Thank you. Very good presentation. The new Vinky and Didier comes. One man.